Hi, I'm Dr. Ursula Hackett, author of Brilliant Essays, your practical guide for university essay writing success. Welcome to my special video series on dissertation writing. This video is about formulating hypotheses for your dissertation. One of the ways social science dissertations differ from ordinary essay writing is the formulation of hypotheses. Hypotheses are formal, written, testable expectations about whatever it is you're researching. They might predict a relationship between two or more variables, or the absence of such a relationship. That would be a null hypothesis. Once you have your hypotheses, you test them by weighing the empirical evidence and conducting your analysis. Your hypotheses need three qualities. They've got to be clear, falsifiable, and ethical. First, clarity. You should construct your hypotheses so that it's crystal clear what your expectation is. That means being as concrete and specific as possible. If you're vague about what is being asserted, your audience won't know what your expectations are and can't judge whether those expectations are ultimately met. For instance, you wouldn't want a hypothesis like, democracy is a good, very good thing. This statement uses the incredibly vague phrase, a very good thing. I don't know what you mean by that, and neither will your readers. You need to ensure your definitions are as concrete as possible. For instance, if by a good thing you really mean that democracy reduces corruption or improves health outcomes, you might substitute higher levels of democracy are associated with reduced perceptions of corruption, or democracy increases a population's life expectancy. Here, democracy is your independent or explanatory variable, and perceptions of corruption or life expectancy are your dependent variables. When you introduce your hypotheses, you should state exactly how you're operationalizing democracy, corruption, or healthcare outcomes. Be as clear, concrete, and specific as you can. Other hypotheses might be too long and meandering to make much sense. For instance, this one's a bit of a mouthful. If people look at social media, they often see immigrants represented in a variety of different ways, sometimes as human beings and sometimes as political pawns, but it's not clear whether this makes any difference in terms of public attitudes. This statement is grammatical, but it's very long, and it's not clear what exactly being asserted. Better to go with something snappier, keeping subclauses to a minimum. Social media posts framing displaced persons as refugees are shared more often than those using the term migrants, or refugee frames increase public support for displaced persons. Migrant frames reduce public support for displaced persons. Hypotheses need to be focused and get straight to the point so that your readers understand precisely what you're asserting. Also, remember that hypotheses are not the same thing as research questions. They're potential answers to those questions, so don't confuse the two. You don't want a hypothesis with a question mark at the end. What causes labour strikes? Instead, give your expectation in propositional form, that is, as a single, clear, grammatical sentence. For instance, electrification increases labour strike activity. So, clear hypotheses are snappy, specific, concrete, and written out in propositional form. Your reader should be in no doubt about the nature of the relationship you're asserting between particular variables or explanatory conditions. The second crucial characteristic of hypotheses is falsifiability. All science rests upon the principle of falsifiability, which is basically the idea that you might be wrong. Not that you are actually wrong, of course, you hope you're right, but that there is some way of observing the world and testing the truth or falsity of what you're asserting, whether that's through quantitative or qualitative research. It means there's a chance your assertions are incorrect and that you have the humility and openness to acknowledge that possibility. Conspiracy theorists, or people who argue that magic exists or that invisible fairies live in their garden, are asserting something that is unfalsifiable. No amount of reasoning or evidence is going to convince them otherwise. And that means most people don't take them seriously. But falsifiability is not just about avoiding crazy stuff. You want to watch out for unfalsifiable statements in your own work. You always need to ask yourself, if I were wrong, what would the world look like? And how would I know if I were wrong? If I were wrong, would my research method alert me to that fact? Very vague and general hypotheses are unfalsifiable because they don't have truth conditions. For instance, you could certainly provide lots of reasons in support of your hypothesis that democracy is a good thing or gentrification is a bad idea. But no matter how many reasons somebody stacked up on the opposing side of the ledger, 
they'd never be able to convince you otherwise if you were determined to hold on to yay democracy or boo gentrification. You can't test whether or not these statements are true. They're unfalsifiable. Other hypotheses that you'd have a hard time testing are those that assert something about hypothetical, unobservable situations. For instance, a bad hypothesis could be something like, if Jeremy Corbyn hadn't become leader of the Labour Party, Labour would have done even worse in the 2019 British general election. That's not falsifiable because you can't rerun history and watch Labour's performance over again. And you don't know who else would have become leader if Corbyn hadn't. Now, this statement could still play a part in academic discussion, just not as a hypothesis. For instance, imagine your hypotheses were shadow cabinet reshuffles reduce opposition party effectiveness, or leaders' policy reversals do not diminish their electoral support, and you tested these propositions and found that they hold true generally. Then those findings could help you to infer what might have happened if Corbyn hadn't led Labour in 2019. But that would be part of your discussion not a hypothesis directly testable in its own right. Similarly, hypotheses that speculate about the future are very difficult to test. You wouldn't want a hypothesis like, in future, robots will replace human beings on battlefields, or companies are likely to shift towards flexible workspaces. Certainly, you can research robotics or business practices, and you might feel confident to make those predictions on the basis of your research. But these would not work as hypotheses for your dissertation because you cannot test them directly. Your hypotheses should relate to phenomena that you can test right now. For example, you might test the best robotic design to enable it to maneuver on the battlefield. If you find that the robot is capable of those maneuvers, then you can be more confident in asserting that robots will replace human beings in future. Or you might look at the conditions in which companies do shift towards flexible working practices or consider whether flexible working patterns improve health outcomes and organisational commitment. Those are your hypotheses, not some airy speculation about the future of work. So falsifiable hypotheses are directly testable by you in the here and now. You're open to the possibility that you might be wrong and can deploy qualitative or quantitative evidence to see whether your expectations are met or not. Finally, the third crucial characteristic of hypotheses is that they should be ethical. That means you need to abide by the ethical standards of modern research and gain approval from your university if you're collecting data of any sort from other human beings. Obviously, it would be unethical to hypotheses that babies raised in total darkness will develop behavioural problems or people can be conditioned to deliver fatal electric shocks because you couldn't test those hypotheses without harming people. But there are subtler ways in which ethical considerations come into play. You need to be particularly careful if you're interacting with children or vulnerable adults, such as those with learning or communication difficulties, patients in hospital, uh, and those with mental illness or addictions. Depending on your project, you might need to consider participant consent, legal requirements, confidentiality, conflicts of interest, intellectual property, and the environment. Always ask yourself, can my hypothesis be tested without violating ethical standards? If not, you'll need to reformulate it. So that's it. You need to create hypotheses that are clear, falsifiable, and ethical. Write them out as specific, testable propositions rather than questions, and always consider the possibility that you might be wrong.